This morning, by God's grace, I want to continue thinking on the subject, grace greater than all our sins. Grace greater than all our sins. Last time, we looked at this text through the lens of Judah. Today, we're going to focus, go back down through these first few verses here, and focus on God's dealings with Judah's firstborn, Ur. Remember after Judah had helped sell his brother Joseph into slavery, he left the covenant community and spends really the next two decades in continual moral and spiritual decline, casting his lot among the pagan Canaanites, adopting more and more of their pagan practices and ways, and eventually taking a wife from among them and fathering and raising his heirs, his children, from among the pagans, the Canaanites. Remember, God had chosen the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as his special set-apart people, his special covenant people through whom the Savior, who, the, the offspring of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent, through whom the Savior would come. And when Judah decides to leave the covenant community, when the, when the son of Jacob decides to up and leave the covenant community, leave the special set-apart people through whom the Savior would come and raise his sons as pagans among the pagans, he was turning his back in large measure on all of that grace. He was, he was grievously sinning against the Lord's people and the Lord's promises. And beloved, it had grave consequences for his boys. It had grave consequences for Judah's sons. Because Judah raises his oldest boys, Ur and later Onan, away from the covenant community, away from the covenant community, outside of the church, as it were. This would have been the family that, that, that parents long time ago were members of the church and had their child baptized in the church, but then left the church. And, 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 and rather than to attend services, decided to sleep in on Sunday morning and, 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 and began living in bondage to their own selfish desires, began prioritizing cartoons and comic books more than Christ began to uh, prioritize Game of Thrones more than the gospel, began prioritizing relationships and education and career more than the gospel, began prioritizing politics and financial success more than the gospel. And, and these boys were, were although uh, uh, almost certainly circumcised, would have been raised outside of the context of the community of faith. And we're going to see that this will have catastrophic results for Judah's boys. This will have catastrophic results for Judah's boys. Do not, listen, do not take it for granted that the Lord let you come to church this morning. <clears throat> Don't take it for granted that the Lord let you sit right here on this morning and be reminded of His gospel again. Because we're going to see what happens to folk that forsake that blessing. We're going to see what happens to folk that, that just decide that, you know, I just, I just think TV and entertainment and social media and my job and my golf swing and everything else in the world is just more important and more interesting than the gospel. And we're going to see what happens to folk who are raised like that. Folk who'd rather do youth sports than do the Sabbath. Folk who would rather uh, be out doing their own thing than come in here in the house of the Lord. And we have a, 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 a deep warning. Listen, this is point number one, a deep warning about our sin. A warning about our sin. That's point number one, a warning about our sin. What, we, what we're going to see here is we're going to see sin that provokes God's judgment. Sin that provokes God's judgment. Look at what it says in the verse. It says, And Judah took a wife for Ur his firstborn, 
and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. You see, I, I, just think, I just think that is absolutely amazing because the Scripture won't let us believe that Ur just died. I'm sure that there was something that happened in his life. Uh, maybe he got sick. Maybe, maybe there was an accident. But the scripture, the scripture won't just let us believe that he just died. The Scripture make a, makes a special point of repeatedly declaring that the Lord himself personally put Judah's firstborn to death. And listen, beloved, that is shocking. That's shocking. That's shocking. Don't, don't, just, don't just overlook that. Don't just, don't just read those words. The Bible repeatedly reminds us that this was Judah's firstborn. And if you don't think that that's a big deal, just I want you to keep in mind that this is Jacob's first grandson. This is Judah's heir. And if you know anything about biblical history, do you, if you know anything about God's working through the patriarchs at this time of redemptive history, we know that the children, that was the means by which God was working through the promise to bring the Messiah. And for God to make the decision to put Judah's firstborn to death, that was shocking. That was shocking. Listen, if, if, there, if, there, if there are any boys... That if there's any boy that, that we might expect would get a pass on sin, just based on family connections, it's Judah's firstborn boy. He was a direct descendant of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah. And the Lord saw that. He knew that this was Judah's firstborn. He knew that this was Judah's natural heir. And, and he still put him to death because he was wicked in the eyes of the Lord. Listen, beloved, nobody gets a pass on sin. Nobody gets a pass on sin. None of us can afford to take the grace of God for granted. If you are sitting here today and you think, oh, oh, God, uh, oh, God, 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 is, God don't care nothing about my sin because, because look, 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 I, I'm well connected. I, I, my, parents been, I, I, my parents went to this church and, and, and I've been, and my great grandparents went to church and my great grandparents went to church where Earl could say the same thing. My daddy went to church, my granddaddy went to church, my great granddaddy went to church. In fact, they were the preachers, they were the pastors, they were the community leaders, and, and God still put him to death. God's judgment still came to his life. His natural family connections were not enough to escape the judgment of God. You know, and we look at this, we look at this verse, and we think, you know, Ur must have been a truly awful person. He must have done something particularly socially unacceptable and egregious for God to personally put him to death. But you know what? The Bible doesn't say that. <clears throat> the Bible does not say that. I read some commentaries and I, I heard preachers preach about this in, 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 in re researching this sermon. And, and many preachers and many commentaries said, well, well you know, uh, uh, Earth's sin must have been so awful that the Bible just won't even say what it was. But the Bible is never shy about talking about the ugliness of sin. When, 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 <laughs> when, 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 when the, the Bible didn't hide Onan's sin. The Bible didn't hide Shechem's sin. The, the Bible is not shy about talking about sin. But, but, but here's the thing that's, that's, that's provocative, if even more provocative, that the Bible does not tell his sin because it reminds us that all sin, all all sin, all sin is worthy of the condemnation of God. All sin, say it, to, say it with me, all sin, all sin, all sin provokes God's judgment. Your sin and my sin, 
provokes the judgment of God. Our sin is deserving of God's instant personal condemnation. And you are, oh man, Lord have mercy. Dr. Jo- I've told this story before. Dr. George Sweeting tells the s- story of watching several blocks of ice floating down a river at Niagara Falls. And curiously, several birds floated above the water looking upon those ice blocks for fish. And one seagull spotted a fish frozen in one of the blocks that was hurtling speedily toward the giant waterfall. Without realizing the danger ahead, that bird, that gull swooped down and and grabbed hold of that piece of fish and that carcass and began and began pecking at it and, and, and riding on the block of ice. That bird didn't realize that its claws, its talons were being frozen to the block of ice. And as the bird finally realized its danger and tried to fly away, it was too late. The bird died, stuck to the ice as it plummeted down to its death. And beloved, that's exactly how sin is. All sin, all sin, all sin will drag you beneath the righteous judgment of God. Not just socially unacceptable sin, not just, not, not, not just the people that we can distance ourselves from and point our fingers at all sin, greed and jealousy and gossip and slander and lust and sexism and racism and all sin. All sin drags us beneath the judgment of God. Our very union with sinful parents places us under the judgment of God. And listen, beloved, we live before the sight of God, before the face of God. None of us are far off from God. God is omnipresent. You know what that means? That means God is right here, right now. That means God is in, oh my goodness, God is spirit. He, 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 he's beyond, he's beyond the realm where we can see him with our physical eye, but that don't mean he's not here. <clears throat> That don't mean he's not here in all of his thrice holy glory. Listen, listen, God, listen, listen. We we, we need to put ourselves right here in Ur's place and wonder why we are not condemned just like Ur. We, we, here we are sitting in our pews and, and, and we sitting in our comfortability and we also sitting in our sins and the holy God is looking down at us and we ought to be wondering why are we dropping dead just like Ur did. How can we escape this great judgment that's coming against sin and against sinners because we are united to sin? Well, listen, beloved, the only way we can escape, the only way we can escape is an even greater salvation because of union with Christ. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. The only way we can escape is is, is because of the salvation that's coming in Jesus Christ. This brings me to my second point, my second and last point. We had a warning about sin, but we also have an encouragement about God's grace because it's grace that unites us to Jesus. It's grace that unites us to Jesus. You see, it wasn't enough for Ur to be united to Judah. Ur was united to Judah, but Ur needed to be united to Jesus. He needed to be united to the greater line of the tribe of Judah because because that's where the blessings are. That's where the grace is. And you know what the Bible does? The Bible holds out to us a a, a countercultural, counterexample. In this very same example, because remember what the passage says. The passage says, Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and it says, and her name was Tamar. Tamar was the least likely person in this entire story to find herself beneath the grace of God. Lord have mercy. She was was a woman who came from a pagan people and a pagan household. She was a woman who was not a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Judah. 
This was a woman who had been a stranger to God's covenant people and a stranger to God's covenant promises. But God gave Tamar something that Ur never had. God gave Tamar the grace to treasure his covenant promises, the grace to treasure his covenant people, the grace to treasure the coming offspring, the grace to seek participation in the inheritance. And listen, beloved, Tamar would not let this go. Mm. And listen, beloved, the whole rest of the, listen, and the whole rest of the story, we're going to get into more of it uh, by God's grace next week and the week following, but the, but the whole rest of the story shows Tamar's, uh, the outworking of her faith, how she, how, how uh, even when she had a hypocritical husband that, that, that did not exemplify the grace of his own circumcision, a hypocritical husband who was circumcised and yet living an uncircumcised life, here's a woman that, that knew and learned about the God of Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and knew and learned about the God of Judah and said, oh, even though I'm a Canaanite, even though I, I grew up in, in, in a house that, that was filled with idols, even though I got some mess in my past, there's grace that is greater than my sins. Lord have mercy. And, 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 and Tamar sought to join herself to this community. And even when Judah tried to uh, uh, push her away, she would not quit. Even when Onan tried to push her away, and, and, and even when Onan misused her, she would not quit because she understood that she needed to be joined to the community of faith, that she needed to be joined to these promises if she ever had a chance of salvation. She would not let it go. She wouldn't let it go, and her faith causes her to hang on to the hope of union with God, promises, and God's people literally over decades. Decades. Decades, man. Ur dies. Onan exploits her. And then Judah abandons her. And she waits. And she waits, and she waits, and she waits, and she waits for two long decades until the youngest boy grew up, and, and, and she's still holding on to this promise. And, and then she reaches out at you, hey, 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 you done forgot about something. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting because, because, because there was grace connected uh, with that covenant. There's grace coming from the God of Judah. And, and you don't just abandon me because, because I'm so glad that God, even though Judah abandoned Tamar, God never abandoned Tamar. And you see, there was faith in her heart to be joined to God's people, to God's covenant, and ultimately to God's Savior. She ends up being in the end, whereas Ur and Onan fell under God's judgment. Tamar ends up being vindicated ends up being blessed, ends up bearing the heir of Judah, Perez, who winds up being the direct link to King David and ultimately to Jesus Christ himself. Woo! And, 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 and whereas, whereas the, 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 the boys who, who had the physical link to Judah found themselves under God's judgment, the Gentile, who was afar off and who was the least likely, finds herself under God's grace. You don't tell me what the Lord can't do. The Lord can do it. And, and listen, and He won't do it based on your own merits. He won't do it based on your own personal connections. He won't do it based on your bank account. He won't do it based on your righteousness. Nothing your hands can do. No family connections, no church attendance, no pastor that you send other can bring you to faith in the Lord. Only Christ himself and only union with Christ can transform a sinner from being seen as wicked in the sight of the Lord to being seen as righteous in the sight of the Lord.
to being seen as righteous in the sight of the Lord. And you wonder to yourself, what in the world is keeping God's tidal wave of, of judgment from, from, from rushing over my life right now? Well, it's only because of the offspring. It's only because of Jesus. It's only because of His mercy that's holding back the tidal wave of God's judgment from coming over your life right now. And ain't God good to you? The reason God, listen, listen, the reason we are, listen, outside of Christ and apart from faith, we are no different from her. Wicked in God's sight. Wicked in God's sight. Miserable, wicked, woe, curse in God's sight outside of faith in Christ. Outside of union with Christ. Outside of being joined to Him. But in Christ, we go from being wicked in God's sight like Ur to being righteous in God's sight like Jesus. Oh, man. Because the Bible says that in Christ, listen, listen, the Bible gives a testimony of how precious it is to be joined to Jesus. The, 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 the Bible talks about all the ways in which we are joined to Jesus. Galatians 2.20 talks about us being crucified with Christ. Colossians 2.20 talks about us being uh, dead together with Christ, dead to sin. Romans 6.4 talks about us being buried together with Christ. Ephesians 2.5 talks about us being made alive together with Christ. Colossians 3.1 talks about us being raised together with Christ. And Romans 8, 17 talks about us being glorified together with Christ. And so if you are in Christ today, that is your only hope. If you are in Christ today, all of the benefits of Christ, His life, His righteousness are joined to you. And in Christ, God sees you as favorably as He sees His Son. I know that's hard for you to believe, but, but, but in Christ, God loves you just as He loves His own Son. If you are in Christ, God will raise you just like He raised His own Son. If you are in Christ, God will glorify you just like He glorified His own Son. If you are in Christ, God will vindicate you just like He vindicated His own Son. If you are in Christ, God will keep you just like He kept His own Son. If you are in Christ, God will bless you just like He blessed His own Son. Now, ain't that a good blessing today? It's good to be in Jesus. It's good to be in Jesus today. Tamar was vindicated because of the coming Christ. <laughs> Tamar was blessed because of the coming Christ. Despite her pagan background and despite even some unscrupulous trickery, by faith God dealt with her, God smiled at her, God blessed her in view of the coming Christ, and He will do the same for you. Listen, the Apostle Paul's absolute favorite reference point and description of the of people of God standing is in Christ. The most important description that Paul across his letters gives to the believers is that they are in Christ. That is their position before God, in Christ, in Christ. There's no, there's no better place you can be. There's no more wonderful place you can be. There's no more glorious, comforting place you can be than in Christ today. A duck hunter was with a friend in the wide open land of southeastern Georgia. Far away on the horizon, he noticed a cloud of smoke. Soon he could hear the crackling as the, as the wind shifted, and he realized the terrible truth that a brush fire was advancing so fast that they couldn't outrun it. So rifling through his pockets, he soon found what he was looking for, a book of matches. He lit a small fire around the two of, of them, he and his, his friend, and and, and, and they didn't have long to wait. They, they, suddenly, they, they covered their mouths with their handkerchiefs, and they braced themselves, and, and the fire came near, and the fire swept over them. But they were completely unhurt, and they were completely untouched. Why, you ask? Because fire would not pass where fire has already been. Lord, have mercy! Lord, have mercy! 
fire would not go where fire has already been. And listen, the fires of God's judgment will not go where the fires of God's judgment have already been. And you may be asking, where have the fires of God's judgment been? Well, the fires of God's judgment came upon the person of Jesus Christ. Lord, have mercy. The, the, the fires of God's judgment, listen, they already came upon Jesus at the cross. And listen, if you are in Christ and you can say the fires of God's judgment have already been on Jesus, then that means that they won't anymore pass over me. That means they won't come to me. That means they won't touch me. That means I'm free today. That means I'm forgiven today. That means I'm blessed today. Oh, that's hallelujah. Hallelujah indeed. And you might be sitting here guilty knowing that you deserve God's judgment. And you do deserve God's judgment, and so do I. But I'm so glad that my hope today is that I'm surrounded by Jesus. I'm covered by Jesus. I'm caught up in Jesus. And the fires of God's judgment against my sin won't pass over me because they already passed over Jesus. Praise God today. Oh, ain't that good news? Come on, ain't that good news, New City Fellowship? Oh. I love the words of the hymn writer George West Fraser. He wrote, Once I stood in condemnation, waiting thus the sinner's doom. But Christ in death has wrought salvation. God has raised him from the tomb. Once I was to God a stranger, filled with enmity and fear. He has rescued me from danger. Love revealed and brought me near. He has rescued me from danger. Love revealed and brought me near. Now I have a life in union with the real and Lord above, now I drink in sweet communion, some rich foretaste of His love. Soon, O oh Lord, in highest glory, all its vastness I'll explore. Soon I'll cast my crown before Thee, while I worship and adore. Ain't that good news today? It's so good to be joined to Jesus. It's so good to be hidden in Jesus. It's so good to be in union with Christ today. That's the good news. That's the gospel today. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the blessing of being joined to Jesus. Oh, God, we are grateful, oh, Lord, that, oh, Lord, we, we have been given a, a union and a, and, and a connection, a family connection that's much greater than any natural family connection that we could ever have. Oh, Lord, I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful that I'm, I, I'm Shirley and Michael Edmondson's son. But I'm even more grateful that I've been joined to my elder brother, Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, I'm even more grateful that because of his blood, you've made me the son of, you've made me the, an adopted son of God himself. I thank you today, Lord, for that spiritual union. I thank you, God. I thank you, God. I don't, we don't take it for granted, God, what you've done for us, O oh Lord, in bringing us uh, into your family, O oh Lord, bringing us out of darkness and, and, and bringing us out of the world and bringing us into your household to make us your own sons and daughters. We praise you, Lord, because that's our only hope. Our only hope is our connection with you. Our only hope is the benefit that you have, 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 have purchased for us, oh God. Oh Lord, it, it's got nothing to do with what our hands can do. Nothing to do with, with us pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, but everything to do with what Christ's hands have done and the way he has lifted us and raised us. And so we praise you for that, Lord, and we honor you for that. You've been bigger to us in our lives than we realize, and you've been better to us in our lives than we realize. And so we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name, and all of God's blood-bought children said, amen and amen. Let's stand together.